The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to How Convertible Notes Work, um, a webinar with Moisen Legal PC. Uh, we've got Matthew Moisen on the line and uh, Early Growth Financial Services. Uh, my name is Zoe Bernstein, and I'm the marketing coordinator at um, Early Growth Financial Services. And we are going to go over convertible notes. Matthew, do you want to say hi? Hey guys, uh, happy to be here and uh, early growth. Thank you for having me. Great. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, this is a quote from one of our CEOs, uh, our CEO, David Ehrenberg. I'm just going to go ahead and read it. Um, as you can see above, those are some of the big companies that we've worked with in the past. Uh, startups face a huge burden in today's economy, often having to choose between funneling resources towards creating their goods and services or managing the often complex accounting tax and financial strategy planning necessary to run a successful business. So that's kind of where we come into play. Um, I can tell you a little bit about Early Growth Financial Services. Uh, we're an outsour uh, excuse me, an outsourced financial services firm. We provide uh, financial solutions to early stage companies. We support about 18% of the privately funded venture-backed com uh, startup companies in the U.S. We do CFO consulting, accounting, valuations, and taxes. Um, we, I, we're more than happy to um, touch base on all of those. Okay, one moment here. Just want to make sure. Okay. So um, this is where I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Matthew. Um, Matthew, would you like to get started? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, sure. Zoe, thank you so much. So again, my name is Matthew Moisen. I'm the founder of Moisen Legal PC. We specialize in representing uh, entrepreneurs, uh, startups, creatives, in a variety of uh, different business transactions, ranging from formation to financing to uh, eventual sale or exit. Um, uh, go ahead with the next slide, Zoe. So what we're going to discuss on this webinar is convertible notes, and I'm hoping that this is going to be more than just me speaking. So uh, as we're, as I am speaking, please feel free to uh, type in some questions, and we're either going to answer them as they come up or uh, at the end of the uh, webinar to the extent uh, easier. Um, so let, let's just jump right in. So what are convertible notes and why do you care? So you're a small business, you're a startup, and you want to raise capital as most small businesses and startups do. There's a couple different ways you can do that. You can do what's called an equity round. You can, you can raise debt, which is the equivalent of a loan, or you can do uh, some combination of, of the two. And in essence, what a convertible note is, is it's a combination of the two. So a convertible note is a debt instrument, so it's a loan, that converts to equity upon uh, certain events. Um, the benefit of a convertible note, or, or, or why it's used in early stage funding, one of the reasons is it's, it doesn't cause any dilution uh, when it's issued. Um, it's typically not taxed, um, and there's no valuation. So um, the way a convertible note works is you have what's called a cap and, and you have a discount, and we'll get into that in a second, but in essence what it allows you to do is streamline the process, uh, it gets you a, a, the, a the, the money in the door quickly, um, and those are all positive things. Um, let's go ahead and get the next slide here. So to give this reference, let's, let, let's talk about uh, the funding cycle of a startup. So the first capital you raise is, is often called seed capital. It's from angels or friends and family. Um, after you raise that, you're going to hopefully raise some early stage and later stage capital, and then you get into series A, series B, series C, et cetera. Um, the early stage capital is hopefully going to come from uh, either an early stage VC or a angel investor. Um, 
and you see what this slide, what this slide shows is is the perfect life cycle. So it shows it shows you walking through the process of you know your first funding round, your second funding round, your third funding round, and then the eventual IPO, um, initial public offering. That could also be a sale of the company. Coming backwards, you want to make the um, the seed capital as cost effective and efficient as possible. Because when you're in that period, you know, what we've titled here the valley of death, you're, you're still, you may be pre-revenue, you may be pre-product, you're trying to prove out uh, your idea. Um, and as you get into this early stage, you know, as you're, you're climbing up this ladder, the first, the second, um, hopefully you're, you, you've either broken even or you're starting to uh, make money, which gives you a bit more flexibility. Um, uh, Zoe, go ahead and click the next slide here. So let, let, let's let's review what exactly a convertible note is. Um, again, convertible note is a debt equity hybrid, um, meaning it is debt until it converts. Um, it has interest in terms. It it while it's debt. It has interest specifically, so remember you're going to be paying interest on uh, on the note. Um, once it converts, it, behave, it it is going to convert right into stock. So so it it very much allows you to kick the can. Um, one of the beauties of convertible notes is when you're an early stage company and cash is tight and you're pre-revenue and uh, you just need some capital to prove out the idea. You, you're unable to set a lot of things. You, you know, you don't know what a proper valuation is. You don't know um, who should be on the board. You don't. You may not have an advisory board. So what you want to do is is do something that enables you to get the cash in the door as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible. Um, Zoe, uh, it looks like there's a question. Go ahead. Yeah, um, Ali asked a question. Can you speak about what the market's like, um, you know, in terms of interest rates and capital raise? Yeah, for sure. So um, interest rates have varied between about 5 and 10%. Um, I would say uh, market is somewhere around 5 or 6%. Um, that is also very contingent on what the, and bear with me, we're jumping around a bit, but it's also contingent on what the maturity date is. So the maturity date is the, uh, the date that the note becomes due. And depending upon how the note is drafted, upon the maturity date, you either have to pay back the note, the note may automatically convert, or the note may convert at the election of the note holders. So the maturity date is something that forces action of the company. Um, in a perfect world, you want to raise your next equity round before the maturity date. So uh, what we often see is, is the... So in other words, what I'm saying is the maturity date, uh, the, the longer it is, the more beneficial it is for the company in a lot of ways. The shorter it is, the more beneficial it is for the investor because the investor wants to um, force action by the company. So if it's a, a year maturity date, we typically see around 5%. If it's a two year maturity date, we see a little bit higher. And the reason for that is um, giving the investor uh, some kind of additional incentive to allow that longer maturity date. Um, typical maturity date is, is usually around 18 months. I think a year is a bit short. I think two years is a bit, is, is a bit long. Um, and whoever, uh, Ali, if that, let me know if that clarifies um, or not. Um, go ahead and uh, hit the next slide, Zoe. So again, we've, we've kind of touched on, 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 a, on a bit of these. Um, let's, just, let's just revisit them uh, quickly and then we'll get into uh, the more detailed discussion. So uh, when you're raising money uh, and, you're, if, and if you're trying to decide, do I do a convertible note, do I do a price round, or you know, maybe I'm gonna do a safe or a KISS, which are, are other uh, instruments that you can raise capital on. Um, the benefit of a convertible note is it's, it's rather short. Um, it's relatively simple. Um, it's flexible to the extent that uh, it works in a variety of different um, cir uh, circumstances. Uh, and again, you don't set a valuation of the company. You set what's called a cap. Um, we also we often see uh, five hundred thousand dollar raises at five million dollar valuations. That's a pretty standard uh, term for a pre-revenue company. 
uh, that often assumes that the founder has some uh, history of other companies, maybe an exit, uh, maybe they were an employee at a large company. It, it, it really, um, those initial terms are very much contingent on the uh, resumes of the founders. The, the better the founder team, the founding team, um, the more likely that will be. Uh, so I would shoot for around a 10% number. So, you know, 500 or 5 million, approximately 10%. So if you're raising 250, I might do it at 2.5 or 100 at a million. That that 10% is, a, I think, a good first round uh, goal. Um, if you're raising a lot more money than that, so let's say you're raising uh, two, three, four million dollars, a convertible note is probably not the right instrument for you. Um, it also assumes you, if you're raising that much money, you probably have done a, a previous round. Um, and it, when you're stacking convertible notes on top of each other, they get they get a bit more complicated. Um, uh, Zoe, go ahead and click the next slide and uh, give me a sense of what kind of questions we got. Okay, um, so we received uh, two questions from Paul. Paul said, um, what's the 18th month rate difference? And also, what's your view on uh, crypto equity? Um, so the 18, the, so I, I, Paul, I think you're referring to 18 months and, and the, um, the interest rate. Um, again, 18 months is, is a pretty fair term. And I, I would think interest around six or 7% is fair. If it's a one-year note, I would push for a you know five percent interest, and if it's a twenty-four month note, I might settle for a uh, seven or eight percent interest. So it's really that five to eight uh, range. Um, cri crypto is really a whole different conversation. So uh, um, I don't know that I'm prepared to jump too far into it. What I, what I will say is uh, it's not you really wouldn't be issuing a convertible note. You, you might issue what's called a SAFT, a, a simple agreement for future tokens, which is almost a precursor to an IP, uh, to ICO. Um, we have done those, but it's a little bit out of the scope of what we're talking about today. So Paul, if you want some uh, additional information on that, uh, feel free to reach out and we can discuss that in more detail. Um, was there another question? Yeah. So, what if um, what if they've raised five? Uh, Paul asked, "What if they've raised around five million pre-revenue?" Um, I don't know, if, Paul. I don't know if you can answer this on the spot. But it, did you? How did you raise that? Did you raise it on a note or a, a safe or some other instrument? Um, he said a note. Um. Well, okay, so uh, you know, Paul, I'm not exactly sure what the question is. I, I guess what I would say is you, you, that's the upward cap of what I think you should or can raise on a convertible note. Whatever you're doing next should be a price round, um, and you need to raise uh, whatever that round is at a you know significant valuation that's above whatever the cap of your convertible note is. Um, a little too. Uh, a little too much in the kind of in the weeds for for this uh, conversation with such a large audience. So, Paul, if uh, if I can help, please feel free to reach out uh, offline. Um, Zoe, go ahead and click the next uh, slide here. Yeah, um, I've got a few more questions for you, Matthew. Um, Anthony asked, um, "What can you discuss the merit of a safe versus a convertible note, and then convertible note versus a safe?" Yeah, yeah, uh, great question. So. Um, there are there are two other instruments that are similar to a convertible note. One's called the KISS and one's called the SAFE. Um, a SAFE is a simple agreement for future equity. Uh, I believe they were published originally by Y Combinator. They're very popular on the West Coast. Um, I'm out here in New York. I can tell you they're not so popular in New York. Um, there's 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 really the main difference between a convertible note and a safe is that a safe does not have interest and does not have a maturity date. So uh, safes are to some extent looked at as more friendly for the company because you don't even, you don't address those terms at all. Um, the other high level difference, and again, this may be, uh, this is a bit complicated, so bear with me, but with a safe, so, so let's just, just let me come backwards for a second. So remember that when you're issuing convertible debt, whether it's via a safe, a convertible note, or a KISS, um, you're issuing the 
uh, the, the conversion into the next round. So in, in a node holders or, or safe holders perfect world, the next round is a series A, that's a price round uh, where, you're selling, uh, where you're selling equity and you're selling it at a good valuation and there's good terms and you have a, you know, again, in the node holders mind, you have a, a good quality venture capital firm that's negotiating quality terms um, for, for itself. And then the benefit of the safe and node holder is a safe and node holder gets to ride that, the coattails of, of that venture capital firm and, and gets those to that. A convertible note, um, if it's not drafted well, the convertible note holder will get the same exact equity as the uh, as the venture capital firm in that series A. With a safe, safes often convert into a shadow series, um, and the shadow series has slightly different financial terms in er in order to preserve the price per share on certain events. Um, and again, you're getting a bit complicated, a bit hard to explain without you know doing some drawings. But high level, that that that's my opinion. And what I would say is. But frankly, we represent both companies and individuals who, uh, and, you know, so we've negotiated on both sides of that, of, of both sides of a company raising a note, a company raising a safe, and an individual uh, investing on a note and investing on the safe. Um, my opinion is, quite frankly, it doesn't matter. My opinion is uh, both can be structured properly. Um, I'd advise speaking to a lawyer if you're, you know, engaging in this transaction. And... Uh, you know, as long as you're careful, I think they both say it serve, serve the same purpose. Um, ultimately, my opinion is that the investor will drive the uh, the mechanism, whether it's a safe or a note. And you know, if he's if he or she is writing a big enough check, I I don't know that you care. Uh, Zoe, what 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 else we got on the queue there? All right. Um. So Rick. Richman asked, is conversion to preferred shares a standard term? And what are the advantages to the investor? I'm sorry, say that once more. Okay, one moment here. Is conversion to preferred shares a standard term? And what are the advantages to the investor? Yeah, so, so um, conver uh, any of these convertible instruments, uh, you know, again, safe, kiss, uh, convertible note, um, they they convert at um, typically three different events. They convert at maturity. They convert upon a what's called a qualified financing, which is usually defined in the documentations. Um, and then they convert upon sale of the company. Um, upon so upon mat so let let's take maturity first. So upon maturity. Um, that means that the company has has most likely not raised an additional round. So in other words, there, there wasn't a triggering event that forced the company to convert the note and or first forced the investor to accept shares. So upon maturity, the note holders will often convert into common stock. Um, upon a qualified financing, so again, the company is raising more capital and typically it's raising capital on a price round, the, the note holder is going to convert into preferred stock and likely either the same stock that that, um, that venture capital firm is getting or the same stock with slightly different terms. Um, it, again, it's, it's, the differences there are minor. Um, upon sale of the company, the convertible note will um, likely either convert into common or the convertible note holder will get basically the greater of conversion into common or repayment of the note plus interest. So that 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 conversion is contingent upon what your cap and discount are and what those numbers um, uh, kind of flush out to be. Um, now, changing the conversation slightly. So when we talk about common versus preferred shares, um, preferred preferred shares don't actually mean anything. So what I'm saying is. Uh, when you tell me you have preferred shares, I say, okay, that's great. I know you have shares that are better than common, but I don't actually know what the terms of those preferred shares are. So, um, you know, if, you're, if you've done a series B or series C or series D, you may have different classes of preferred shares that all have different rights and preferences. So maybe you pay a dividend on one, maybe you don't pay a dividend on another, maybe there's a liquidation preference, maybe there's um, different voting rights. Um, all in any of that can be negotiated. Um, 
But what I will say as a generality is that preferred shares are almost always better than common. Um, typically, preferred, preferred shareholders get a, a beneficial financial treatment. So they may get paid back first. They may get paid, paid back first plus something else, you know, a, a kicker or a liquidation preference or a dividend. Um, they, uh, they often get some sort of voting rights. Um, but basically, when you think about preferred shares, what you should think about is this is the investor somehow protecting their investment and ensuring that they get a return. Um, go ahead, Zoe. What else? Okay. Um, could you elaborate on why a convertible note for a raise um, that's $3 million or $4 million likely does not make sense? And what would make sense in case of such a large raise? So um, it okay. So so the issue with when, when you're raising, let's say above 1.5. So when you're raising more than a million and a half dollars, you you typically um, do a price round. And and the reason for that is uh, once once someone is giving you a certain amount of money, they want clarity on what the terms are. So remember, the the benefit of a convertible note is it's quick, it's easy, and it kicks the can. So the investor who who holds a convertible note has the right to certain conversions into something that they don't know what is. So, you know, when you're raising the convertible note round, you don't actually know for certain what you're going to get. Um, you, you hope you're going to get preferred shares, but you don't know the terms of those preferred shares. You hope that there's going to be a, you know, quality VC negotiating firm terms that you get to uh, ride the benefit of. But it may not be. It, it may be something very different. Maybe, uh, maybe it's a down round. Maybe the VC, uh, it, it's not enough capital. Maybe they don't care. Um, maybe there's no major investor that's, that's forcing the negotiation. So um, there are a lot of positives to being a convertible note holder, and, and that is you're getting in very early, um, and you're getting the benefit of, of this future upside. But the big negative is, is really uncertainty. Um, and... What I've seen in my experience is that when an investor is writing a check over a certain amount of money, they want certainty. They want to be the ones negotiating what their rights and preferences are. And you can't really do that in a convertible note um, by its very nature. So it's, it's, not that, it's not that convertible notes don't work for that scenario. They, they do. You, you can do it. Um, and if you, if you have... Um, <clears throat> unsophisticated investors, um, it may work very well. But what I've seen is that uh, when you're talking to, you know, if you're raising three to $5 million, you, my hope is you have an investor writing a million dollar check and then, you know, maybe a bunch of 500 to $250,000 checks, maybe uh, 750, you know, you have bigger checks. And when people are writing that big of a check, they just, they, they want to know what it is that they're getting. Um, so again, it's, it's not that it doesn't work. It's, it's more like the market demands something different than what the, the very essence of a convertible note is. Um, one other question for you. Can you um, have a note for your pre-seed um, or pre-A round? Yeah, that's kind of a sweet spot for convertible notes. Um, so friends and family, angels, um, you know, pre-seed, <clears throat> Even sometimes seed rounds, depending on how big they are, uh, can can all be can all be done on convertible notes. So that, that's that's kind of the perfect um, that that's really the perfect area for them. Um, the 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 one thing I'll add there is you also have to be careful when you when you do a convertible note round and then you do another convertible note round and another and another convertible note round that creates a very complicated um, ugly cap table. So the other thing to always think about is what's my what's my next round going to look like and uh, who, who am I targeting as investors for that round? Okay, great. Uh, and then um, how does a, ra a down round come about? Um, that's from Larry Smith. Yeah, Larry, great question. So, so a, a down round is any round um, – in which you're selling securities at a lower valuation or lower cap uh, than the prior round. So let's say hypothetically you raise $500,000 at a $5 million cap on a convertible note. Let's say uh, six months later you realize you have to raise more money 
and uh, you're unable to do it on favorable terms. So maybe you raise another $500,000 at a $4 million cap. So what, what you've done is the initial investors took the greatest risk because you were at the earlier stage, but the, the second round investors are getting a better deal. Um, that's, that's a down round. Um, it can be both with equity or debt. Um, uh, and then there's another term, there's more terminology, which is a bridge round, which is not really considered a down round. It's just considered a round between rounds. Um, down rounds are looked at very negatively. Uh, bridge rounds are not. Um, if you do a down round, uh, you know, again, so like most convertible notes, most safe don't really address down rounds. Some of them can, some of them, some of them do um, in a price round so when you're actually giving equity when you're when you're when you're selling shares of the company <clears throat> there's usually protection against down round so the um the investors will get the benefit of whatever the next round bears um and then there's a couple different types of protection full ratchet half ratchet weighted ra weighted average um but again that's gets a little complicated to do uh on the fly Okay, my next question for you is from Guy. Um, a major benefit of a note is that it can be faster, cheaper, and less complicated to execute than a priced round. If you're raising from a VC firm um, that does a lot of priced seed investing, do you think that's still true? Or do you think that a VC firm might be able to execute a priced round just as easily as a note? Uh, my opinion is that even if you do price rounds all day, every day, it's still cheaper and easier to do a note. Um, we were in the midst of a price round right now. And, um, you know, the typical price round has, um, you know, you, as soon as you introduce, introduce preferred shares, um, there's no way that it's simple. There's no way that it's easy. A convertible note is a three page document. Um, there's not much negotiation. There's not many terms when you start talking now, now there's a flip side to that. And the flip side is, a, a, an experienced VC may say, here's our terms, here's our documents, take it or leave it. And if you're willing to take that kind of deal, then sure. Price round is, is super easy. You, you get a bunch of documents and you sign them. Um, but to the extent you're getting a lawyer involved and negotiating a quality deal, um, even when uh, the VC firm does it all the time and the VC firm sends you their docs and you rely on their lawyers to do a lot of the work, there's still a lot of terms uh, that need to be negotiated. There's just, there's just a lot of moving parts. Um, and I guess that begs the question, well, well, can't you do a price round with common shares? And the answer is, of course. Uh, but again, if I'm a venture capital firm, I don't want to stand on the same grounds as the founder. I want to protect my investment. And the only way that I can do that is to be granted preferred shares. Okay, great. Um, I've gotten a lot more questions here. So should I just keep going down the list, Matthew? Um, sure. Why not? Okay. Um, Ali just said, what are some typical informational rights uh, that a company would give to its note holders? Uh, none. Next. Okay. Do, um, in terms of the valuation cap, should it generally be 10 times the amount one seeks to raise? Um, that, that's kind of my rule of thumb. Uh, you know, again, like 500 out of 5 million, we see pretty frequently. Um, I, you know, again, like there, this, this is one of those, this is one of those, there's no perfect answer and, and the market will ultimately bear um, a, a response as to whether or not your valuation is reasonable. So, um, and it's also where notes get complicated. So if you're raising a million bucks to a $10 million valuation, yes, you can, again, you can do that on a convertible note, but that's just a big number to see on a convertible note. Um, so perfect world, you give up 10% because that gives you enough flexibility going forward to raise additional rounds and uh, retain a large percentage of the company. So again, remember that once you get in this fundraising cycle, at some point you get kicked out the back end and you want to make sure that you retain enough of the company where it's still interesting for you. Um, if you give up 25, 30, 40 percent of the company on the first round and then you do another round, well, now all of a sudden you're diluted down to, you know, 15, 20 percent. Um, 
that's not that interesting of, of a business anymore. So um, we try to keep it around 10%, um, but ultimately the market's gonna bear the reasonableness of, of, of those numbers. Okay, and then Larry just asked, what does the value, um, what does the valuation go down? Why does the valuation go down, excuse me? Yeah, so, so, so again, the, the valuation is gonna go down if, um, if uh, the, you need more capital and um, you're not in as good of a position as you were before. So valuation, you know, again, the valuation is ultimately what you and the investors, you know, and, and again, just to be clear on a convertible note, it's not a valuation, it's actually a cap, but the cap is gonna be whatever the investors and you agree to. So if you're in a position where you're running out of cash, where you need money, where, you know, maybe a key employee left, uh, maybe your product, uh, uh, something went wrong with the product. I mean, all those things are going to uh, change um, what the what the ultimate cap would be. So again, the market's going to bear uh, the reasonableness of that. Hey, so let, let, let's uh, move forward a little bit here and, and start talking about some additional convertible note um, note provisions. I think we have a slide in here um, that also has some clarity. Yeah, we we discussed this. Let's go to the next one. So. A couple, uh, just a couple quick points. Uh, you know, again, a lot of this uh, we've touched on. Um, I want to touch real quickly on accredited investors. So um, it's important to know uh, your investors are a part of your company and whether or not they're sophisticated plays into how easy it's going to be to run your company later on. It's also going to play into um, the various security law exemptions that you may or may not be entitled to or able to claim. So in a perfect world, all of your investors from day one are accredited. Um, that means they're making $200,000 uh, or more in income. Expect that to continue or $300,000 jointly and or they have a million dollars more of uh, liquid assets. Um, let's, let's push on to the next. So this, this again, we, we touched on a lot of this. So these are the terms that you should be cons, uh, cognizant of. So again, the interest rate we've discussed, note term maturity date, again, we've discussed <clears throat> discount. Um, discount's important. What the discount is, is it protects against um, a raise that is below the cap. So the discount and the cap work, work, work hand in hand. The cap, so let's say it's a $500,000 raise and a $5 million cap because that seems to be our baseline. Um, <clears throat> what the cap does is if your next round you raise at a $10 million valuation, the note is going to convert at the note cap. So the cap's an important term. Um, the company, quite frankly, wants it to be as high as possible and the investor wants it to be as low as possible. The discount protects against uh, the, the opposite. So if you have a $500,000 raise at a $5 million valuation and your, uh, your next round you raise at a $4 million valuation, I'm sorry, a, a, 500, five, a $5 million cap, and the next round you do it at a $4 million valuation, that's where the discount kicks in. So the discount's gonna say that the early stage investor, that, that note holder is gonna get the, uh, the, the discount from that valuation. So we often see 15 or 20% discounts. That's rather standard. Again, it's best the best interest of the company for the discount to be as low as possible. And it's an interest of the investor to be as high as possible, as high as possible. Um, th those two really go, go hand in hand. So um, on a, on a, on this, on this uh, standard raise, we're talking about 500 out of 5 million. We often see, a 15 to 20% discount. Um, <clears throat> if I saw a 50% discount, I think it, it, it was absurd. And if I saw a, um, you know, $15 million cap on a $500,000 note, I would also think that that was a bit absurd. Um, the final term that uh, you really need to think about is what's called the qualified financing. So um, as I stated earlier, the note converts upon your next fundraise. And uh, your next fundraise is defined by this term qualified financing. So the note's going to specifically say that you have to raise more than X dollars. Um, and you should think through what that number is. Um, this ties directly into my prior comments around um, kicking the can and uh, certain investors wanting certainty. So 
the higher the qualified financing, the better it is for the node holder in the sense that they're going to ensure that it's a sophisticated venture capital firm or sophisticated angel or sophisticated investor that's that's pushing uh, that round forward. So let's let's use this 500 out of 5 million again. So you have a 500 out of 5 million and the qualified financing amount, let's say, is, is $1.5 million. That means the company has to raise $1.5 million or more in order to trigger conversion of the notes. If you raise a million dollars, the note's still outstanding. And again, the rationale behind that is <clears throat> if you have a higher qualified financing, you also have a more sophisticated, either you know, hopefully major investor or lead investor who's going to drive better terms and the note holder is going to get the benefit of those better terms. So that you see the same definition in, in safes and KISS and in convertible notes. It's something that um, most, most entrepreneurs don't focus on, but I think it's something that, that is really important. Um, the lower the qualified financing, the better it is for the company, because again, the company wants the note to convert as soon as possible, but you run the risk that you know if you have a $200,000 qualified financing number, that may be a bridge round, and then what do you do with the note? You know, what does the note convert into? It gets a, it gets a bit murky. Um, so again, something to, to think of and, and be conscious of. Um, Zoe, why don't you go ahead and click the next slide? Okay. Um, I guess we're gonna address all the questions at the end, just so you know. I've I've gotten a few more questions on my end, so if we want to go uh, circle back, I guess at the end of the presentation, I think that might be the best way of of doing that. Matthew, what do you what would you like to do? Yeah, yeah I, we, we've gotten a bit off track. I just want to try to get through a couple more slides here, but um, I'll go quickly if uh, if there are a bunch more questions. Oh, okay. <clears throat> um, again, interest rate, um, you have to have interest on a convertible note uh, because it's a debt. So if it's not debt, the IRS will impute interest. That's not good. So uh, put interest. Um, and we've talked about interest quite a bit. So um, again, it begins to accrue on the date the note signed, obviously. So you, you execute the note, you get the money, interest starts to accrue. It typically accrues on a daily basis. And again, interest is paid when the note converts. So the other, um, so the reason the interest rate gets interesting is because upon conversion, you're not conversion, converting the $500,000, you're converting the $500,000 plus interest uh, accrued to date. Um, go ahead uh, with the next one. <clears throat> so again, we've, we've spent a bunch of time uh, on maturity. You'll see here it says 24 to 36 months. 36 months is extremely long. Um, maturity is something else that I think most entrepreneurs don't focus on but should. Um, the maturity date is really important because um, it forces action. So if the note hasn't converted yet, and depending upon the terms of the note, um, you have to think through, okay, do we want to force conversion? Do we want to pay back the investors? Do we want um, or, or, or do we want the investors to choose whether they're converted or the note extends? So what, what you have to remember is that if you've hit maturity date and the note hasn't converted, um, one of two things happened. Um, either the company was extremely successful, meaning that uh, you didn't need to raise any more capital, um, and if you didn't need to raise any more capital, that's great. Uh, you know, so let's say you do this 500 out of 5 million, you do a 500 out of 5 million, and then you're, then, you know, you, you blow off the rails and you're profitable and you never need to raise more money again. That's great. Now you've hit maturity and you're going to have a conversation with the investors as to what they get. Remember, they want preferred, but you haven't ever issued preferred. So they're most likely going to get common. More likely than not, that what happens is um, if you've hit maturity and the notes haven't already converted, it's because the company is in a poor financial position. So if the company is in a poor financial position, you clearly can't afford to pay back the notes. So you're forced to convert the notes or have a conversation. Um, that gets really tough because the investors are, are probably not going to be that easy. Um, they're going to want to understand how they got here, why they got here, and they're also going to understand, understand how to get their money back. So that gets to be a bit of a death spiral. Um, so it's something, again, like when you issue this type of convertible debt, you should be trying very hard to ensure conversion of the notes within a reasonable period of time. 
Um, go ahead to the next slide, Louie. Um, again, we've, we've, we've spent a lot of time on this. Um, you'll note the, the last bullet point there. Um, this trend towards lower discounts also directly uh, uh, ties to the, the lack of interest rate in a safe. Um, the, the goal, I think, of, of the newer rounds we're seeing is to uh, be fair and be consistent, I, I think 20% is, is rather standard. Um, keep going, Zoe. I don't know how many slides we have left here. I, I think the cap, we've discussed a bunch. Uh, go ahead and go to the next one. So again, we've discussed, we discussed this a, a lot. Short maturity dates are very, very tough for the company. Huge discount rates are a bit ridiculous. Um, there was a question around uh, information rights. Thank you. Um, I, I wouldn't give out information rights on a note. I think that's too burdensome on the company. Same thing with restrictive covenants. Um, and again, this idea of, of, of debt kind of lingering forever also gets uh, uh, troublesome. Um, go ahead to the next. Okay, let's let's take questions because walking through these um, these different conversion get, get, gets a bit uh, a bit complicated. Okay, do you want to take questions right now? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Um, in your experience, does it take longer to close an equity round with a single investor versus doing a convertible note? It can take three to six months to do equity, but what should you expect for a convertible note? That was from Paul. <clears throat> yeah, convertible note rounds are typically pretty quick. So, you know, uh, uh, we've seen them close as quickly as, you know, within a couple days. It, it, it's... What I would say is uh, circle your investors and, and have conversations and get loose commitments. And then once you get enough loose commitments, you send the, the convertible note. There's really not that much back and forth. Um, you get it signed, you get the cash, and you move on. Okay, great. Now, Rick uh, Rick Richmond asked. We um, He raised $122,000 with seven investors. That comes um, – that's that's due on March in March 2018. Uh they have not had an equity event. What do many people do or many companies do in this situation? Um, yeah, again, like it, it's contingent on your note. So let me just give that caveat. I mean, you're, you're, if your note, you have to look at your notes and see what it says happens on maturity date. If, um, if the notes become due and payable, you need to have a conversation with the investors because you know, clearly my guess is you don't have the funds to make that, make that a reality. So, my my answer is uh, uh, start having a conversation uh, in January. You know, bring the investors up to date. Um, see if maybe they're interested in investing more cash, or explain why your initial assumptions have worked or not worked. But at the end of the day, you need to reach a deal. Okay, great. Um, I, my next question is um, by Anthony, and it's how do costs compare between issuing a convertible note versus issuing equity? Cost. So we, uh, you're looking somewhere between a thousand and let's say five thousand dollars to issue a convertible note. Um, the the lower end of that is uh, really you giving terms. You saying to me like, hey, here are the terms. Go draft the document, and we draft the document. Um, the higher end of that is you giving me terms and us going back and forth with investors for you know a, a lengthy period of time. Um, Seed rounds cost between fifteen and fifty thousand dollars in legal fees um, per side. So uh, again, equity rounds are expensive. They take a lot of time, and and they're rather complicated. Okay, and then do you re recommend having a most favored nation MFN provision in the note? Um, my opinion is most favored nation clauses only benefit the note holder. So I. Would say no. Um, you know, basically, no. Most favorite nation clause uh, allows everyone to get the benefit of a more favorable term. So um, I don't. I don't like them in notes. I've seen them in notes. Um, I would. I, I. My preference would be, to, you know, as company counsel to object. Okay, great. And then what happens with uh, this is from Bianca. What happens with investors in equity crowdfunding who are not accredited? Do they affect future rounds? Yeah, the answer is yes. And and equity crowdfunding is a is a bit 
beyond the scope of this um, because there's a couple different ways to do it and it gets very complicated. Um, so depending upon what exemption you, you claimed in that initial crowdfunding um, and, and the way in which you ran the offering, um, that will that will make a difference as to what you can do next. So unfortunately, uh, I, I'm not a huge fan of equity crowdfunding. I, I, I think uh, it adds a lot of complication, a lot of fees. Um, so you know, we have seen it done successfully. I, I think um, Kickstarter and the other perk-based or, or gift-based uh, crowdfunding is, is a much more interesting way to go because you avoid a crazy cap table and you avoid a lot of different investors who may not be that sophisticated. So, um, unfortunately, that that one's a bit tough, uh, a bit tough for me to respond to. Okay. Um, if you begin to raise, this is from Paul. If you begin to raise capital using several convertible notes, is it important to keep the notes similar? In other words, would it be a mistake to have a cap and interest rate on one note and then another note without a cap? and a discount instead. Is this going to create headaches later or is it not a big deal? Yeah, so uh, the answer here relies, in my opinion, relies on the security laws. So um, within the security laws, you, you have an obligation to provide uh, each investor either with the same terms or disclose to each investor what the terms are. So remember that um, convertible note is a security uh, I'm going to argue that safes are securities, but people may or may not disagree with me. And same thing with kisses. But um, let's just let's just accept that as true for a moment. Um, when you're selling a security, you're, you're triggering, um, you know, the, the Securities Act of 33 and the Exchange Act of 34. Those are uh, very serious. There's serious implications if you fail to comply with them. So uh, if you can convince two different people um, to give you two different terms, and they're both fully aware of the terms. Okay, great. Um, but to the extent you're raising one round on different terms, you're in essence, in my opinion, committing fraud because wh wh whoever is getting the lower or the better deal um, is getting it at the detriment of the guy who's getting the worst deal. And ultimately, the guy who's getting the worst deal isn't aware of the guy who's getting the better deal. So I, to me, that's something that's a, that's a red flag. It's something you should be very careful and conscious of. Um, I'm not telling you I haven't seen it done. I'm not telling you that it doesn't happen. I'm telling you that my preference is to avoid it. Um, okay, this is a question from Guy. Are, the, um, are there typical convents or um, on converts? If not, can you give some examples of covenants? You excuse me, covenants. You would or wouldn't accept. I apologize, Guy. Um, yeah. So again, like conver conv on on the in the no purchase. You know. So again, like. Convertible notes can have a lot of different forms. Um, in the note purchase agreement, you, you do often see uh, reps and warranties. Um, <clears throat> often they're 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 much more onerous on the investor than they are on the company. Um, the company will usually rep to its cap table. They may rep to the the size and structure of the board. They may rep to uh, that they're duly authorized, validly you know that the they're in good standing, that the shares are duly authorized and validly issued. Um, all those things are, are rather standard and really don't cause uh, much reason for anxiety. And on, on the you know the opposite side, the investor is going to represent they're accredited. That um, you know there's a whole series of security law representations that are accredited. They're buying the securities for their own account. Um, uh, they're they're not a uh, if it's a Reg D you know that they're not a uh, foreign person or if, that they if they are a foreign person that they are a foreign person. So. The no purchase agreement um, may have some of those. Um, I would expect the company's reps to be limited. I, I'd, I'd expect the uh, investors' reps to be very, very much uh, aligned with uh, with you know Reg D uh, regulation under the securities laws. Okay, great. And then um, John requested that we go back to slide three to go over it again. Um, do you want to do that at the end of the presentation? Uh, how many more questions we got? We have about three. Uh, yeah, sure. Let's run through the questions. We can do that at the end. Okay. Um, in what scenario might an investor agree to be a uncapped note? Um, so 
We don't see too many uncapped notes. Um, we, we've seen uncapped notes with a discount. So in other words, I get, I'll, I convert at whatever the next round is plus a discount. Um, you know, and then I think the discounts usually tip usually, usually a bit higher. So, you know, 20, 30%. Um, I don't, I don't see why an invest an investor would agree to an uncapped note. I, I think that's actually hurtful for the investor. Um, listen, it's good for the company because the company now is basically uh, getting the benefit of the capital today on the terms to be negotiated later. So, so, you know, when you think of a convertible note, the whole reason you're, 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 the whole reason the investor is giving you this money at the cap is because they're hoping that the next time you raise money is at a larger cap. So if you if you delete that, you know, early money in gets a reward thing. Um, I don't think it's too interesting to a investor. But again, if it, I guess there's always a caveat, and that is if the company's a rocket ship and the investor thinks that you know uh, they're willing to put their money in regardless of of what happens next, I mean, I guess that could happen as well. Okay, great. And then for, um, uh, okay. Um, and then for um, the last question is, can we have a copy of this slide? Um, yeah, we will be providing a, a copy of the presentation to all of the attendees at the conclusion of the webinar. Um, John actually re responded and wants to know if we can just go back to uh, back three slides not the third slide but just go back three slides to review it again um sure. at this time we don't have any additional questions so don't know if you want me to move forward with doing yeah yeah go ahead. yeah go ahead and go back um i don't know what's three slides back is this the right slide nope oh sorry i think that might be the yeah that's three slides back so um, let's see in one sec. Um, one moment here. Okay, back one more. The conversion discount. Matthew? Yeah. Um, I believe this is the correct slide. Sure. So, okay. no, yeah. 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 So, 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 so again, there's, there's two terms that, uh, of the note that work hand in hand. The, the first is the cap and the second is the discount. So the cap protects against a high valuation. So again, if you say it's a $500,000, note at a $5 million cap and you raise money at $10 million, the investor is going to convert at $5 million. So in other words, no matter what you raise your next round at, as long as it's greater than $5 million, the investor is going to convert at $5 million. Um, the discount deals with the situation where the next round is below the cap. So the discount is a discount off of the Valuation of the next round, um, if the next round valuation is less than $5 million. So like, again, hypothetically, let's say it's a $500,000 note, $5 million cap with a 20% discount. If you raise your next round at a $4 million valuation, the investor is actually going to convert at 80% um, of $4 million or, you know, a 20% discount, right? So he's going to convert at $3.2 million. So he's going to get the benefit of a lower valuation than the $4 million. The same way the cap works with regard to a larger uh, round, the discount works uh, with regard to a smaller round. Does that answer the questions? Or uh, uh, if there's any additional question on that slide, let me know and I can try to hammer it again. I think we are good on our end. Um, do, let me go ahead and just fast forward to where we were. I believe this was the last slide. Um, this is the last. This is the last slide. Okay. Wait, say, say, say that once more. I'm sorry. Um. I yeah. Is this is this the slide we we reviewed this slide already? I'm assuming. Yeah. Let, let's go through those. Um. Uh. 
spreadsheets. We can run through the spreadsheets real quick. So let's just look at, yeah, example number one. So, oh, yeah, let's look at this one. So if you jump to the middle of the screen where it says conclusion, let's just start there because it's, it's easier. It says, at this series of evaluation, the note converts using the discount, creating 2.4% more equity compared to the cap. The note holder's return on the Series A is 1.25. So let's run through the terms. So um, you have uh, company pre-funding. You have 8 million shares outstanding. You have convertible note terms, 575, uh, no cap, 4.5, 20% discount. And then you see the terms of the Series A, 1.5 million investment, um, $4.5 million valuation. Um, and then you see this this green uh, uh this green bucket or, or, or thing below, it says note holder converts via discount. And the reason for that is if you, if you go back up to the next, uh, if you go back up to the next, the next row, you'll see it says, it says discount and cap in orange. Um, and then if you look at the different conversions, so you have an effective valuation, a share price, number of shares, you have effective valuation, and, and those are two different, uh, those are two different numbers that are contingent upon whether you use the discount or the cap, right? So when you look at, okay, this is the price per share if we use the discount, this is the price per share if we use the cap, the note holder is gonna get the benefit of whichever one of those gives him or her a better deal. And you'll see below, uh, below there, it is note holder at conversion, note holder at conversion, and you see the two different, uh, the two different metrics there. Um, so something that's really important, I guess we can finish on is, you know, maintain your cap table and be very conscious to, um, what the conversion mechanism is and what the ending, uh, result for the company is. Um, so Zoe, I'm going to go ahead and end there. We're, we're a couple minutes early. So if there's any additional questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay. Um, do we want to just give the audience about, or all the attendees about uh, a minute or so just to rally up any last minute questions? For sure. Okay. Um, Doug would like to discuss the um, second Excel slide, this one. Um, sure, so, so, so the first one showed um, uh, conversion via the discount. Um, this one shows conversion via the cap. So again, you have, you have uh, if, if you look over there on the left-hand row, um, shares outstanding is the same, the note size is the same. But here you have a $1.5 million investment at a $13.5 million valuation. So if you if you go back up to the next area, you'll see um, Series A conversion uh, at the uh, discount renders a certain number of shares and a certain share price. Series A conversion at the cap renders a um, a bit more beneficial, lower a lower share price, and more more uh, a larger number of shares. So the the note holder is going to get the benefit of the cap. And then you'll see over there in the conclusion it says um, the note converts using the cap because that creates more equity for the note holder compared to the discount. Um, so again, you know the, the the cap tables here are are a bit difficult to run through, but um, you see when you look at the share price and you look at the number of shares issued. In the um, in this instance with the cap, you're getting a 46 cent share price, 1.3 million shares issued, and 12 approximately 12 percent of the equity. Um, whereas uh, using the discount, you're only getting 500,000 shares and 5 percent of the equity. So the note holder is obviously going to want 12 percent as opposed to uh, 5 percent. Okay, and then this question is from Meter. Uh, do you see convertible notes? safe and other type of securities completed, completed, abandoned with advent of ICOs, with the advent of ICOs? No, I think there's, those are very, very different marketplaces. 
Okay, and then Anthony, um, Anthony's question is, any comments on the fundraising environment for entrepreneurs raising, raising a seed round? Yeah, it's gotten much tougher. Um, I think if I think if you look at the the data, um, raising uh, early stage rounds is much more difficult than it was a couple of years ago. Um, there's been some uh, interesting reports on that, you know, uh, showing that data over the last couple of weeks. So I think it's gotten much harder for early stage companies to raise capital. The flip side of that is, I think uh, because of that, that, there's a ton of opportunity uh, within early stage investing. Great. And I think that covers all of our questions. Um, thank you guys all so much for joining us today. Um, thank you, Matthew, for all your advice and help. Um, we, we really appreciated it. And if you guys have any questions, you can always follow up with, um, with us with this contact information. And we will be sending out a copy of the slides. Great. Zoe, thank you so much. And I appreciate early growth for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you guys all for attending. We appreciate your time and uh, we look forward to hearing from you.